I'm probably about seven by now. Hi, everybody. I'm Dr. Scott Warden, the TOS guy, and welcome to our live stream with myself and Dr. Art Jenkins from New York. Good afternoon, Art. Hey, good afternoon, Scott. Good to be here. It's great to have you as usual. Uh, I can't tell you how many compliments I've gotten from our viewers, people who reached out and they want to know a lot about you. So I'm really glad you're here to share more of your expertise. Today, okay. we're going to be talking about how you as a patient can find the best TOS specialist. And as we've discussed before, there is no specialty that owns TOS. It's not like when you break a bone and you see your orthopedist. It's not like when you get a heart attack and you see your cardiologist. Just historically, this is a really orphan territory. It doesn't belong to anybody. So while certain fields tend to see it more, you may find in your city or your state, you have any number of specialists ranging from primary care docs to super specialists who are experienced with TOS. And that's why we ask you to reach out to people like myself and R. Jenkins, who's a person I refer a lot of patients to, and try to find those specialists in your area. So all right, what I decided to do is make a list of specialists and primary care docs, and I figured we'd kind of walk through them and share our thoughts on what those docs do, because a lot of patients may not know the difference between a physiatrist and a podiatrist. And after we define what they'll do, then we'll talk about how they might see patients with TOS at what stage and what they might do about it. Sound good? Sounds great. All right. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go to my list. I'm going to start a basic adult doc, an internist, an internal medicine doc. And I used to be one of these. And internists are, um, they have to know a lot about everything. They, in many cases, are the quarterback for their adult patient's care. If you are younger than, let's say, 18, you might have a pediatrician, but we're going to stick mostly with adult TOS here. So an internist may not specialize in nephrology, the care of the kidneys, or cardiology. Some of them do go on to specialize and do fellowships in those things, but they tend to take care of adult patients and put together all the opinions of every other doc and every other person that contributes to the care of an adult. So Art, in your experience, when you have a patient referred to you from an internal medicine doc. What's their general level of expertise on TOS? Oh, I mean, I think TOS is such an, as you mentioned earlier, it's like an orphan condition. Um, <clears throat> most people, most generalists don't know much. Um, then, and, and I'm delighted when I see one that even recognizes the name and tries to put it together with a clinical syndrome. Um, you know, as you said, they, they have to know some about a lot of things. Um, and so, uh, you know, I'm always uh, delighted to get a consult for TOS. And then, but like, you know, like many, like most of my patients, if I, they're coming from a rather a generalist background, I'm going to have to do a very deep dive to make sure that they're not, you know, presenting with one of the many different uh, clinical syndromes that overlap with TOS. Um, so, and I think that that's going to become a little bit of the uh, recurring theme, I think, of tonight's talk is that I'm, I'm going to be deferring back to the concept of you need to make sure that whoever you go to um, has an open mind, um, doesn't get pigeonholed, um, and, you know, thinks about all the different things and does and treats many different things. So going to your primary doctor, if you think you might have TOS, or even if you don't know you have TOS, you just got arm pain uh, or, and problems with your arm and shoulder area. And you're like, well, what is this? I don't know. Let me go to somebody who knows what they're talking about a little better than I do. And that's, that's the process of winnowing your way down into, um, into getting the right diagnosis um, and getting it, uh, getting, getting, then getting it treated after that. Um, so yeah, you know, it's, it's, you know, definitely when I get a, a referral from an, an internist whom I don't know. Okay. And obviously it's very different if I get a, re a referring, uh, referral from an internist, I do know, um, because more likely than not, if they do know me, we've had this conversation at least once or twice before. And, and right. we've, you know, we've gone back through, you know, they told me a little bit about what they did on how to get to their preliminary referral di level diagnosis. And I'll talk to them a little bit about the things that I 
would do if I were in their shoes, trying to make a decision as to who would, what the next step would be. And so that that's part of my how I work with my my internists, my referral, my primary doctors, um, is that we we have a, a mutual exchange um, and we get to know each other a little better and get to know what we treat a little bit better. Um, so it's um, so that's that's but that's generally where I'm where I'm at with a, an internal medicine or a pediatrician or family doctor level referral. So having gone through internal medicine training and board certification myself, I don't remember ever hearing about TOS. But as an internist, what I would have known, hopefully, and I'd like to think that I would have, is that there is a peripheral neuropathy, that there's some nerve-related entity. And many internists might start out by doing a decent neuro exam. Uh, they probably would be unlikely to know about the specialized provocative tests that we talk about for TOS. But at least if they're thinking upper extremity radiculopathy where a nerve root is pinched, they might get a, an X-ray of the chest or cervical spine. If they are thinking TOS, they could at least look for cervical ribs, even though as specialists, we know that that's a so-so relationship. But it's a starting point. They might get a cervical spine MRI, right, to look for neural foraminal stenosis or a herniated disc. And uh, what I see in many of the patients that I come in contact with, Art, is they'll start with their primary care doc. If they're lucky, their primary care doc will know it's something neurogenic. They might suspect TOS, uh, especially if the patient gives a history of reaching or arms overhead. But once they go down the path and get a cervical spine MRI, most of those cases, the cervical spine MRI is negative because TOS patients are young. They haven't had time to develop disc herniations, degenerative disease. So their nerves are clean coming out of the spine. Now, at that point, the internist has to figure out what's going on. And I think that will be the point where they'll start looking for a, a referral base, somebody that knows more about this. For you as the patient or viewers, the main thing I'd say is just what Art said before. I'd reinforce it. You want a doc who's open-minded. If a doc says, I don't know what it is, I'm going to find out. That's a good sign. If a doc says, well, it couldn't be TOS because I don't know anything about it, that's a bad sign. So you want to move on from there. So let's go on to another primary care doc that people might see. Um, I'm going to pick from this list a chiropractor. And I'll just share my experience that there are some chiropractors I know who recognize TOS or have a high level of alertness for it. Um, and my best guess is this is because they have a lot of hands-on time with patients and they do a lot of manipulation to different positions and they pay attention to patient positions. Um, I don't know how much interactions you have with chiropractors in your regular practice. Uh, quite a bit. I actually have one in one of my offices. Uh, so yes, uh, and I've worked very closely with a lot of chiropractors over the years. And, you know, there, there are some great chiropractors and, you know, there's just as there are some great spine surgeons and, and, you know, and, and like every other specialty, there are some who are, shall we say, below the average. Um, and so I think the issue there really comes down to, um, do they listen? Do they investigate things that they don't know or understand? Um, and I think part of the, the other key point, um, I think primary care doctors are far more attuned to this. Um, and, I, and some chiropractors are as well. Are they part of a, a, a formal or informal network where they can get consultations with other knowledgeable people in a particular area? Um, you know, for example, my chiropractor will, you know, pull me aside every time I'm in the office and be like, oh, listen, I saw this interesting patient. What do you think? Or, or you know, uh, and, and I obviously do the same for some of the patients that I'm looking at. Um, and so it, there's that. Um, and then I also have a few chiropractors who will call me up whenever they have a question. So you want to make sure that they have the, um, the curiosity and the, mm -hmm. the, uh, the ability to recognize that they are not the one and only treating clinician, um, for any entity. Um, and that it's, we we're, it takes a village to take care of a patient. Um, and it's important. You don't want to be the village idiot. <laughs> you know, you don't want to be the one who, who treats them in a vacuum when there's 
a, a plethora of, you know, when there was an enormous supply actually of resources available, um, ranging from Dr. Google, which is plus or minus, uh, to, um, to actually having other clinicians that you can bounce individual cases off of in a, in a, you know, a non-judgmental and, 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 you know, informational way. I've had the privilege of working with several chiropractors and observing their physical examinations. And it's a very interesting difference between some of the physicians I know and the chiropractors, how they approach it. Some of it's very ingenious. And as you mentioned, part of a team, I think there's for some chiropractors who are knowledgeable, just like you and I know, there are some docs who, let's face it, are subpar at TOS. That's okay. We have specialists we know. So with the chiropractors I like and can have discussions with, I found some really unique value to them, as have my patients. And I think it's one part of the conservative approach that can help certain patients do very well. And as we know, many patients who get TOS don't go to surgery, and we hope to keep it that way. So Absolutely. let's move on. Do you have another comment, or should I go to the next specialist on our list? Move along. All right. I'm going to bring up a physical therapist at this point. Now, physical therapists, uh, I know several in the Bay Area, and they have different approaches. And I think just like, Art, you have your specialty and your diseases that you're really specialized at. There's a lot of them. Uh, physical therapists with TOS, they have different approaches. And I'm starting to realize they may be as varied as some of the approaches doctors take and with different levels of success in different patients. Again, like chiropractors, they're very observant. They have a lot of hands-on time and they add some value to the team, you know, very good value, both before and after surgery or to prevent surgery. Your two yeah. cents. Yeah, no, I, certainly. Um, once again, it's also, um, you know, how do they, how do they work as a team? You know, there are, um, I, I definitely get, you know, calls from, from different therapists and, and, uh, you know, whenever I get a, a call from a therapist, obviously it's a, it's a patient who is, uh, has an issue bad enough that they're going to a therapist. So it's, it's a, it's, they, there's a major problem there. Um, and so, um, and they'll often have, um, you know, a lot of information about, you know, oh, well, they also have this, the, they're activating their, these muscles and they're activating those muscles. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, you know, trying to put all of that together into the picture, um, is, you know, it's part of the, the process. Um, it's, you know, the therapists are, um, once again, you know, if they're, if they're TOS knowledgeable, um, oh, I, I will just say that, you know, just like a lot of other specialists, there are people who think that they're knowledgeable and they really aren't, um, or maybe they're putting bravado on saying they're knowledgeable because they don't want to admit that they're not. Um, and so I, I, I do find that the, the biggest problem I have with therapists um, and referrals is very often I'm getting the referrals from the therapist when they failed physical therapy um, mm -hmm. and they're not getting better, which the flip side of that is, of course, if they get better with physical therapy, then they don't need a referral to someone like me. Um, and so, you know, there is a certain selection bias there, but, um, you know, it's trying, sometimes I wonder is that the therapist didn't understand what the issues were and therefore couldn't provide the very specialized types of therapy that are, that are related. Um, and, you know, given the fact that TOS is poorly documented, there, there are really are not good recent double blinded studies that describe one physical therapy and another with uh, regard to um, TOS. Right, right. Um, and it's so it's it's a difficult uh, it's a difficult entity um, to to manage and to to come up with a and and then part of the problem with that is again as as you, Scott as you and I have discussed many times, TOS is not just one entity, and so um, you know very often somebody may have a strategy um, to manage one type of TOS that has worked for them, they then may get discouraged because they have another patient who doesn't respond to right. it. 
Right. But it, because it's two different etiologies, um, you know, and you can't imagine, you can't expect a, that you're going to manage a cervical rib TOS patient the same right. way you'd manage a, um, uh, you know, a, uh, a, a scalene triangle impingement the same way you'd manage a, uh, a costoclavicular sure. impingement the way you'd manage a pectoralis minor impingement so or or a combination thereof um and with 17 different muscles that support the scapula it <laughs> gets complicated it gets complicated quickly so uh in my experience i i reinforce everything you've said and i go back a step it takes a community it, this disease is not low-hanging fruit not low-hanging fruit i've yet to see a specialist who can even on 80% of cases, just take care of this by him or herself. Um, it's a challenging disease. When I've spoken to physical therapists, I've been amazed at some of their knowledge of uh, how muscles control the posture of the body, the position of the arms and all joints, and how um, they really understand the musculoskeletal system very well. Uh, they don't understand some of the anatomic variations that I know, just like I don't know some of the muscle work that they know. But that's great to put me and a physical therapist together and you or anybody with your level of knowledge, even though there's very few of those, right? So um, I've found that they add a tremendous amount to the team because a lot of these cases are brought on by muscle imbalance and theoretically should be responsive to restoring that muscle balance. And you brought up the scapula. It's just free floating bone is controlled by all these different muscles. And we use our arms so much in so many different ways that it's almost to be expected that those muscles would get imbalanced. And for whatever reason, in some people, they just get to a point that they create pain, either from stretching or compression of the nerves where we get TOS. So and I'll also reinforce that going back to chiropractors for a second, they see some things and they explain some things that to me are almost Greek and I have to really ask a lot of questions. So in this difficult disease, people who have a different perspective of the elephant, the blind man, who feels the hoof and the blind man who feels the tail and the blind man who feels the ear. That's where we are. We need to put those heads together to come up with that picture of the elephant. Um, for patients, for our viewers, um, what should you look for in your chiropractor? I kind of skipped that. Probably about the same as the physical therapist. Number one, do they have a level of knowledge about the disease or are they just kind of pushing their standard treatment? That doesn't work. They have to know what they're doing. Number two, are they open-minded? Do they realize that they're part of a team? It's it's rare for a physical therapist to make someone completely better, but they can certainly contribute a lot. So uh, ask questions, make sure they're open-minded. It usually involves working with a team of other people to really get TOS and resume a normal life. And, and with that, I'm gonna go back to my list. And at this point, I'm gonna go to kind of a primary care doc slash specialist called a neurologist. Now, neurologists, I saved for the last in this small section because um, I have found, uh, unfortunately, that a lot of neurologists train in places that say TOS is disputed, the old thing which we've discussed before. And without me getting on my soapbox about why TOS should never be disputed, um, it creates an easy excuse for someone, a neurologist, let's say, not to study this disease. It is a tough disease. I've been doing this 20 plus years and I learn new stuff all the time. And uh, so it makes it easy to escape and say, I don't need to learn anything because, hey, maybe it doesn't even exist. So that's one red flag for you, the viewer, as a patient. On the other hand, neurologists are trained to see these amazingly subtle changes in your nervous system and a good one like a Tracy Newkirk in our area and other ones I've met, Dexter Sun, Dexter Sun in New York, they can really contribute a huge amount. So with that, I'm going to pass it to Art and ask about your experience with neurologists. Yeah, I think it, it really just, like you said, it comes down to are they dogmatic or are they pragmatic? Are they, are they thinking about the patient in the office and what can I do to make them better? Or are they dogmatic saying, well, somebody told me that this isn't that serious that this is disputed, that there, this, if you don't have EMG findings, it's not real. Um, and just because somebody said it doesn't, they don't listen to their pragmatic experience of saying, well, I've 
actually, when you listen to patients and you examine the patients and you can reproduce their pain directly with the physical examination finding that's consistent with, you know, these things, you know, that's, that's being a, a, uh, essentially it's being a scientist. It's, it's looking at the hypothesis, test the hypothesis, actuate the theory that's, that, that manages the hypothesis. And then if necessary, adjust the hypothesis. Um, but if, if they, if they take a scientific approach as opposed to a dogmatic approach, um, you know, you're going to, you have a better chance with the scientific approach, um, and, and so it's really, you just got to talk to them and find out, is this something that they, not only do they treat, but do they just stop and listen and say, I, I don't want to talk about diagnoses. I want to talk about your symptoms. Tell me what you see, because, hmm. you know, and that's why, and so the good neurologist will, will go, you know, past what you think it is to, well, what do you see? Because they really, ultimately, it's the doctor's job to make a diagnosis, not to just rubber stamp an existing one. And so uh, for patients to directly ask your neurologist about TOS is a fair question, especially in this age of Dr. Google. If you get a response like rolling eyes, you probably need a different neurologist. Um, I don't work with too many of them anymore like that. I work with some very good people and I'm very fortunate to work with really good people around the country that includes neurologists. But I can tell you in every community, I certainly hear the other side of it because we talk to a lot of patients here. And when I hear patients who've gone a few years without a diagnosis because a neurologist said your EMG is negative or you can't have TOS because it just isn't, uh, that's troubling to me because they have an opinion like, oh, the New York Mets are the best team in baseball. And you know, that's easy to say and it doesn't mean anything. But when you say something that affects a patient and they have to suffer from it, you know, that's a different level of responsibility. So um, I'm not going to go into my, again, my soapbox. I'm going to try to stay off of it. But TOS is real for a lot of reasons. And no one should ever tell you you don't have it because it couldn't be. You don't have it because they have a different diagnosis. You don't have it because they tested you for it and there's no evidence for it. That's a different answer. By the way, as a general rule for our patients, and I'm sure Art will support me on this, a good doc will say, I don't know what you have, but I'm going to get you to somebody who I think can help. And a bad doc will just say, I don't know what you have. And stop there. Nobody wants that answer, right? Yeah. Although I will also say in this day and age, um, the, the field of medicine is really getting a lot of external constraints on the way people practice. Um, a lot of employed physicians are really basically being told by their hospital employers or by the, you know, or, or having to react to the insurance company, reducing reimbursements for an individual, you know, office visit or whatnot. And, um, you know, they're, they're told they have to see a certain number of patients in a certain amount of time, and they may not want to treat TOS that might require a more extensive evaluation then they can fit into a five minute, you know, consult. Right, right. Um, and then in addition to that, um, you know, there are people who really, that just say, I, I don't treat this. Um, and if they don't feel that they, if they don't have somebody in their, their group who does, they just say, I, I don't know. And, and it's frustrating to come up with that. And, and I agree with you, Scott, you know, thoughtful people will find a solution, even if it's not in their wheelhouse or not in their network. Um, you know, you can still ask around. Um, but yeah, this is this is um, these are difficult times that we're facing. And I find more and more it is harder and harder to find. And I find this in many of the other conditions that, that I treat. Um, many of the different rare conditions other than TOS that I treat. I do treat things other than TOS. Um, but uh, the that many of them, you know, patients have to travel hundreds of miles sometimes to find anybody knowledgeable in a particular small field. Um, and that's basically it's because they're, they, many of the doctors are being told, many of them couldn't afford to keep their private practice sold to a larger group or to a hospital chain. And the hospital's telling them, this is the way you have to practice. And, you know, 
if you can't conform to to our standards, you you uh, you can't work here anymore. So they it, it is getting harder and harder to find people willing to take on um, poorly understood conditions. Well, as a as a side note, um, I read with great interest your post on LinkedIn recently, uh, moderately in depth about what's changing in medicine, and uh, it does affect TOS patients as a general rule. Uh, while we're talking about how to find the best specialist, I guess part of the talk could also be how do you just find a specialist? And the pressure is on. You know, I don't think hospitals will ever tell a doctor practice this way because there are laws against that, actually. But they have a whole bunch of ways that they've refined over time about how to, um, let's say, encourage you to toe the line. Uh, one of which you mentioned, you only see so many patients per hour, you're in trouble. So uh, many patients do have to pay out of pocket and travel for diseases like this. I still would make an argument that TOS is a lot more common than is written down, but the good specialists are sort of few and far between. And so a lot of patients I talk to and you probably talk to come from a distance. Now, that's unfortunate. Uh, the best way we can change that is uh, patients, so everybody who's listening, help us. I, I, I ask people to subscribe to YouTube channels, uh, go to our other social media like Instagram and Facebook and Twitter, TOSMRI, go to Art's website. Dr. Jenkins has active social media. We need to spread the word, not just for TOS, but that's what we're interested in. But um, for TOS, help spread the word. If you've had a good experience with Dr. Jenkins, let people know. If you just give a thumbs up and you subscribe and you like, those things help push videos like this forwards. And our goal recently has become to get to 1,000 subscribers. We're somewhere around 400. Once we get to 1,000 subscribers, YouTube will give us some more freedom that allows us to expand. But in the meantime, anybody here who has been diagnosed and helped by me or Dr. Jenkins or any of our other specialists or is looking for help, I ask you in return to help the next person down the road from you. Okay? That's my small soapbox art. Hope you don't mind the interruption. So now I'm going to go on to um, specialists, uh, a referral to a specialist who's non-surgical. And the first one on my list would be a physiatrist. And so physiatrists uh, handle a lot of body motion. And uh, I guess there's an overlap with sports medicine docs. Um, but they, they uh, handle a lot more young people generally, musculoskeletal type injuries, and um, over the past few years, I've seen more of them handling TOS, which I think is a good sign. Uh, do you have many connections with physiatrists in New York? I think, yeah, a lot of a lot of very close connections with physiatry. Um, it's uh, you know, neurosurgeons and physiatrists really kind of you know run in the same pools because we take care of each other's patients uh, so closely, um, you know, and and. You know, the, there are so many different aspects. Uh, I, I actually have developed a lot of uh, work uh, over the years um, stemming from my original research and, and clinical work on spinal cord injury and, and other things like that. Um, and I've got made some really great relationships with physiatrists on the subject. Um, many times if I have a, a question or problem, I'll actually go to the physiatrist um, to try to, to collaborate or to develop a, a, a new way of, of looking at it or refine, you know, our existing ways. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, I find the physiatrists are a uh, really a great resource because they have to understand much of the same neurology of the neurologists and they have to understand much of the same physiology and kinesiology of the physical therapists. Uh, because in many cases, the physical therapists are supervised by a physiatrist. Hmm. Um, and so it's, uh, they're, they are a very good non-surgical specialist. And some of them will even have done uh, interventional training and hmm. uh, be interested or willing to do one of the various physical interventions that lead to that, that, you know, to try to treat um, through uh, a partially invasive, uh, you know, a, a percutaneous invasive way of, of treating, um, ranging from um, Botox, uh, nerve flossing, uh, various other collagenase and other injections. So there are, there are many different 
um, types of non-manual therapy and, tr and interventions. And physiatrists are one of the groups that, uh, that can, not all of them do, but, but can um, dive in, dip their, their toe into that part of the, the pool. Um, and so they are often a, a good um, intervening step in somebody who can try to get you off the escalator towards surgery and, and, and right. try to get you both from a diagnostic and a, a non-surgical therapeutic uh, process towards, you know, making you feel better. So that's a great description. They really do cross over a few different boundaries, which is kind of what TOS does. And uh, you, you're referring to uh, muscle blocks, like scaling blocks, pec minor blocks. Um, for example, Dr. Ghosh, who was here a couple of weeks ago, uh, she does those as well. And uh, those have tremendous promise. People in orthopedics and um, other fields are starting to use some of these bioactive injections like platelet-rich plasma, et cetera. And uh, I think it's a very burgeoning new field. These bioactive substances uh, can really um, treat in a way that uh, just a numbing medicine or Botox can't. So physiatrists do cross several boundaries and they several of them do have these skills to do injections. So uh, just to add that into the spectrum for patients, there are treatments like physical therapy that uh, are non-invasive totally. Pain medications are non-invasive, but then you can step up to partially invasive, minimally invasive, ultrasound guided injections, for example, or CT guided injections, and then you lead up higher to surgery of one sort or another. And with that, I'm gonna segue into our surgical specialist referrals. On my list, I have four types of surgeons that I've listed, and there are some differences between them. I'm gonna start out with the vascular surgeons. Um, if there's any one group in this country that's kind of held the mantle of TOS more than others, it's been vascular surgeons. Again, there's still many, many different specialists, but vascular surgeons got involved because of some of the vascular forms of TOS, which are pretty rare. Uh, arterial TOS, or an aneurysm forms, is very rare. The venous TOS is pretty rare. That's where blood clot forms in the vein. But those are things that vascular surgeons do. And because they work in this area where those things occur, they have some anatomic knowledge. Now, you could argue whether that's effective for neurogenic TOS, which behaves differently. But because they have this anatomic background working in the area, it became sort of natural that vascular surgeons do some more of this work than other specialties. Uh, are your experience with vascular surgeons as part of the team? Well, I, I will also say that for many reasons, you know, the vascular surgeons, um, you know, I actually work very closely with the vascular surgeons at my my hospital where we are part of a team and we collaborate and we are doing research together. And, and um, many ways that it's good to have vascular surgery there because there are a, a lot of big red and blue structures that are running in this area. And, you know, you want somebody who is facile with that anatomy prior to diving into the region. Um, you know, I, it just so happened that, you know, for example, in my training, I did a lot of peripheral nerve and brachial plexus uh, explorations for tumors and, and other structures, um, not, or not necessarily for TOS, but for other structures in the area. And so, you know, that was an area that, that I kind of grew up in. Um, and so we speak the language and we understand uh, and when we, we collaborate and, and it's, it was, it's been kind of interesting doing so. Um, but also we have very different skill sets, um, from, from them and they are, you know, if, if there's an injury to a vessel, there's really nobody who has more experience fixing them, uh, than, than vascular surgeons. And it takes that confidence to kind of dive into an area that is, uh, well, shall we say high value real estate? You know, you don't, you don't want to muck around in this area uh, willy nilly. Um, and so the vascular surgeons, and they have many different approaches to this area. That's why there, there are as many different approaches, surgical approaches to TOS as there are. Um, and once again, it, what it comes down to is, um, you know, how do they work as a team and, and how do they, you know, is, 
is all they do TOS, you know, that, that always worries me. You go to a one-stop shop because everybody who walks in the door is going to get that operation because that's what they do. In fact, right. some people who, who run a one-stop shop feel you, they wouldn't be sent to you if that weren't an absolute <laughs> firm diagnosis. I have spine surgeons who view the same thing. Like you're coming to me, you're getting spine surgery. Um, <laughs> but, you know, that's not quite the way it ought to work. And, and, so you've got to make sure that you're going to somebody who understands the overlaps enough to know. So, for example, you know, when I was in training as a neurosurgeon, one of the, the early lessons that I got, I had to understand hips and shoulders and, and, and other joints that were adjacent to that might impact upon the diagnoses that I have. And if you don't know how to, as a spine surgeon, if you don't know how to do a good hip exam, how can you differentiate sciatica from you know, one of the various referred nerve impingements for, at the hip and, and vice versa. Um, you know, there are, uh, God knows I've seen a number of people who have gotten hip replacements for spine problems. Um, and so with the vascular surgeons, really it comes down to, are they, are they thinking uh, outside of the, just the, the, the vascular access area? And are they looking into, is it something else? I mean, you know, God forbid you wouldn't want to have a, MS and have somebody think that you have TOS and have them operate on your TOS that you don't actually have because you actually had MS. And so you, it, it's just, it comes down to, you know, picking the, the specialist who understands that their specialty does is not the only specialty. So the first thing I'll say to our viewing patients is any surgeon in any consideration of surgery, especially for TOS, the experience of your surgeon is a critical factor. <clears throat> there are people who train in it and may do a few a year. And there are other people who do dozens to hundreds a year, depending on their location and their practice. And it's uh, very complicated, as, as Art is alluding to, very complicated anatomic area. Should you injure a blood vessel, you need your buddy, the vascular surgeon, but fast, because uh, you don't have a whole lot of time. So... Um, the knowledge of the anatomy and the knowledge of the area when you're going in through these small surgical portals is a uh, big value added. So if you're seeing a vascular surgeon, and we, we know many of them around the country, um, uh, I, I won't even start naming them, but they, they certainly have experience in the area. Uh, my experience is they tend to have a different surgical approach, many different doctors, but we're not going to go into the details of the different surgical approaches today. I'll just say that. Uh, vascular surgeons do a lot of publication on this. Um, I found that um, their their view of it is a bit different than mine, which is allowed. <laughs> I don't expect yeah. everybody in the world to see things the way I do. Um, very few do. How, how simple would that world be? And it's like it'd be, uh, it'd be so much more efficient, right, Scott? It would be. It would be great if he could be king, right? King of that country. Um, but that's what you know we want to do in TOS and. We want to move things forward, and we have to ask a lot of questions to do that. So uh, I'm going to go to the next type of surgeon on my list, which is a neurosurgeon. Well, are you familiar with any neurosurgeons? My, my thought is, well, of course you want a neurosurgeon, <laughs> but you know that's, you know, it it's um, you know once again it's a, it's a, there are many different flavors of neurosurgeons. There are generalist neurosurgeons, you know. That you, you go to, you know, someplace, uh, you know, a little bit more remote, you may, the, the, the neurosurgeon there may do everything. And then you may go to an academic center or a major city where somebody just does one subspecialty within neurosurgery. Um, and the and ones only that, on the left side, by the way. <laughs> I know people who would like to be, all they do is left L4-5 discectomies. Um, <laughs> but that's, that's also but that, but certainly there's cerebrovascular neurosurgeons. There are skull-based tumor neurosurgeons. There are, um, you know, the point is there's about a, a, about eight or so specific subspecialties, and you want to make sure that you identify if you're going to see a, a specialist, say a neurosurgeon. You want to make sure you see one who is is seeing on a daily basis patients that would be in your wheelhouse. So, you know, if you're looking for a neurosurgeon, you may not want to go to a cerebrovascular neurosurgeon or a skull-based neurosurgeon if you think you have TOS. Maybe a peripheral neuro, uh, 
peripheral nerve trained neurosurgeon or a spine trained neurosurgeon probably would be a better bet. Although even within that, um, the peripheral nerve, uh, certainly, but maybe even in, in spine, not all spine neurosurgeons have training uh, specifically on surgical mm -hmm. treatments of thoracic outlet. Certainly identifying it um, is part of the, um, you know, part of the standards for, for board certification, uh, recognizing it um, and knowing what the surgical treatments are, but not necessarily having to demonstrate a practical knowledge of it. Um, and, and just make sure if you go see a neurosurgeon, ask them right off the bat, do you operate on thoracic outlet syndrome? It's one thing to say, do you treat it? Because theoretically, any doctor treats it if they, if they make the diagnosis. That's treating it. But do they operate on it? And if so, how often? And that's a valid question. To, to ask. And that's a question you should ask your vascular surgeon, your thoracic surgeon, your neurosurgeon, your orthopedic surgeon, your, your, you know, anybody who is hand trained also, I'm going to jump a little bit ahead here. Um, mm. It's do they operate on thoracic outlet syndrome and how often and how many a year do they, do they do? Um, you know, if they do one a year, they probably have some competence if they've been doing it for 20 years and they do one a year, they've done 20 patients. You know, if you, if you're doing 10 a year, that's certainly an awful lot more. If you're doing a hundred a year, then I start to get worried that you're getting into your too much of a niche where all you do is this one thing. Mm -hmm. um, and if you, if you're doing that, they damn well better have a long list of publications to document what they're doing with this hundred a year that they are they have become a basically a, a worldwide referral center for this particular entity and there are some places like that that run clinics and there are volume and, and there are and they and and my feeling is is if you're running high volume you should be publishing what you're doing because if you're doing it well enough that you're getting high volume share that with the rest of the world lots of lots of data to figure out patterns and and publish and, yep it's almost so you brought up you, you brought up peripheral nerve surgeons. Plastic, it's a form of plastic surgeon. So not all Actually, plastic surgeons. Pla peripheral nerve is a subspecialty within multiple different surgical primary oh, specialties. Okay. So you can get to peripheral nerve from plastics, um, and hand is another. That's an overlap with it, with plastics. You can get to it from orthopedic surgery. You can get to it from neurosurgery. And so these are people who take very detailed um, approaches to sometimes the smallest of nerves. And there is some value in that with the complexity of TOS. Uh, absolutely. It's, um, you know, and so if you get, if you have a plastic surgeon who does hand, presumably as part of their training, um, you know, you wouldn't think plastic surgery and nerves necessarily, but they do. And they, it, so it's part of their training to understand when it is and when it isn't. So you just want to make sure you get somebody who is knowledgeable, experienced, and once again, does TOS surgeries. And, and for our viewers, keep in mind that this is not just spine. The thoracic outlet begins at the margin of the spine, but there's plenty of overlap. Patients can have spine disease that looks like TOS and vice versa. And you have to know the spine. You have to know the soft tissues. You have and to know the ribs. And, and sometimes they have both and dif differentiating right. which, what, how much of their pain is coming from which problem. Um, I mean, it, it gets complicated. Right. So, so it's, there's no one surgical field, I think, that trains you to prepare for this. And it really takes a special interest by a few docs to motivate themselves and really learn about this very challenging anatomic area. And the disease is very challenging. Um, for, the, for the patients, if you're going to work with a surgeon, there will be times when you get referred to a surgeon and it doesn't mean you're going to surgery. Uh, to have that early surgeon input, Art will give his two cents. Mine is worth less than his. But in my experience secondhand, I found that the surgeon seeing a patient once and then again in six months to 12 months can be very valuable to judge how much progress a patient is making with conservative care. Are your thoughts on that, on patients who don't end up going directly to surgery? Oh, I mean, I, I, 
I think that I get patients, I would say I probably um, operate on about a third of the patients, you know, within a year of having seen them, um, not, not higher. I, I don't, you, you show up in my office, I'm going to do two things. One, I'm going to try to make the right diagnosis and the right diagnosis may not be something I treat. And two, um, the, I'm going to try to manage you with the least invasive methods first. So, you know, you come in with a big disc herniation, if you don't have an acute foot drop and, and, and impending bowel and bladder, we don't book you for surgery that day. We do a number of non-surgical treatments first. Um, and if you get off the train at any point, you're off the train. Um, and sometimes you get off the train and then you get back on the train a year or two later, and that's, that's life. Um, and so you want to make sure you have somebody who, who is willing to get you in and off the train as needed. Um, and so you also, um, want to make sure you have somebody who understands what that process looks like. Um, and doesn't just say, you know, I don't know how to manage this non-surgically, um, you know, get out. Um, but I think that actually this brings up a good point of any person who is diagnosing and evaluating any of these conditions is you, you want to find out from them, well, what are the criteria by which you are evaluating both my condition today, but my progress in my treatment, either with non-surgical treatment or with surgical right. treatment? Right. What, are, what are the metrics? What are, what are you using to measure success and failure? How do you know when non-surgical treatment has failed? And then more important, equally importantly, how do you know whether surgery was a success and what does that tell you about next steps if it's only a partial recovery? Mm. You know, where, and so understanding, you know, I, I don't want to necessarily, you know, make people feel that we're just turning you into a number and we're treating the numbers. But in many cases, the numbers do guide your, your process. And, you know, for example, uh, you know, patients come to me with one condition or another, and I will always ask them, what's your pain? And, and we'll, I'll dial it into what's your pain here? What's your pain here? What's your pain here? What this, and what, how, how often is it this number? Is it a two most of the time? And it's a seven certain other times, you know, these, so having some metrics actually does give us an idea. Um, and so, for example, one of the common uh, ways that I manage uh, patients with TOS and understand how their progress is, is I'll do the, the grip X test. I, you know, I use this device that you can buy on Amazon. It's cheap. It's like 20 bucks. Um, and you, it tests your, your grip strength because for many patients with TOS, the grip is one of the first things that's affected and it's affected very often in reaching. And so we measure grip strength down in each hand and grip strength after a five second pause up in each hand. And so we're monitoring that as we're going along. And I, you know, I just had a patient recently who um, has had a rather, you know, challenging course uh, of treatment, but we we're measuring her hand strength and we're seeing it going up and up and up over time. And it's, uh, it's very gratifying to see that. And, and so, you know, just, as I said, I just saw this patient on Monday. Um, so she came to mind, but it's, uh, you know, it's it's nice to have these things because these are tangible measurements of how how the disease is being treated. Um, and so you want to make sure that when you go to a specialist, you can ask them. So how how will I know and how will you know? Right. Um, Not when, just we're going to wing it. Let's just right. let's just see and wait. Because like every other disease, there are guidelines, there's experience, there's literature. And, you know, good doc will have seen this a bunch of times and will know exactly what to look for. Sorry for the interruption. I'm sorry, say that again? I said sorry for the interruption. But yeah, it's absolutely true. You, they should yeah. have a plan based on the literature and their experience. Yeah, no, you, you want to be, be systematic about what you do as a clinician. Um, and you know, you don't want to just make it up every time. So for patients going to see a surgeon is not, uh, not the worst thing in the world. Number one, surgeons have an experience that, um, most other docs don't have, but yes, you want to find out their experience levels. Uh, you want to find out what their plan is. And, um, unfortunately that's kind of mixed right now. There are different people who will go, um, 
with different plans and I'm not the person to really tell anybody what the best plan is, partly because of the heterogeneity of the disease and the heterogeneity of the medical literature. Uh, have I left out any specialists that you would think we should discuss? Um, I, I think that for the most part, we've mentioned, you know, the there is vascular surgeon. Uh, they have overlap with thoracic surgeon, and obviously thoracic outlet syndrome. You think thoracic surgeons. And I, in fact, actually, I know one thoracic surgeon in New York who does uh, uh, robotic uh, first rib mm -hmm. resections for primarily for venous uh, TOS. Uh, and, uh, but he um, he and I actually uh, collaborate and even, even asked me about a patient uh, just this morning um, you know, that he was seeing. And he said, you know, well, what do you think of this? Um, and so, right. you know, there's, so there's vascular, thoracic, ortho, neuro, um, and then, you know, hand through uh, plastics. Um, and so, yeah, I think those are the surgical specialists uh, that you'd want to go to. Um, and sometimes, let, let's face it, there's Mr. Right, and then there's also Mr. Right nearby. Um, and, you know, for some people who can't, can't travel, you know, a thousand miles to come see me in New York, um, that, you know, they need to find somebody closer to home to take care of them. Um, then, uh, you know, it's finding, how do they, how do they demo the different specialists that are within their network or within their, um, their, their region or their, their range, uh, so to speak. Um, and I think that's, that's hard. Uh, but I do think that the internet makes it a little bit easier. Um, it allows you to kind of search and have a list. Um, but then it requires the due diligence to call and to find, do you operate on this? Not just do you treat, but do you operate on this condition? Um, because I think most people will say that they can treat it, but that, you know, how often do they is really a measure of their interest level in the condition. Right. All valuable tips. And, um, I, I think that one of the um, side effects of what you described with insurance companies, hospitals kind of enforcing decisions or tilting decisions, um, my feeling is, and I advise most patients, my two cents, that it's worth the travel to see a specialist like you or some of our other specialists. Uh, you're going to live with the surgical changes for your whole life. And uh, the cost of an airline ticket especially compared to how much insurance and hospitalization costs now, it, it's a small part of the picture. So that's my two cents. Yeah, um, you only get one arm on each. You only run right arm, one left arm, um, and you got to preserve it. You know, I, I always tell people you, it's preserving the airframe for longevity. Now, maybe Elon Musk is, is going to get us all robotic bodies that we can have our brains transplanted onto. I wouldn't hold my breath on that one anytime soon, not, not because he's not capable of someday doing it, but my experience has been, uh, let me put it this way, we're still waiting, um, you know, 20 plus years past the time when stem cells were supposed to be curing spinal cord injury. Right. Um, and and that's, from, that's been going on for 20, 25 years that this is around the corner. Um, so, you know, you really, you you only get one body, um, and you need to maintain it as best you can for as long as you can. Um, I mean, me, I want to stick around to at least to see a hundred. So I got to do a lot of stuff for myself and I got to take the best care of myself I can. And, and, you know, you only get one, one go round on this life. So make the most of it. Yeah. I think that's very valuable advice. I think, um, well, I know I've had experience with patients who were suffering. I feel for all of you. They were suffering enough, though, to go and get a procedure. It was just a procedure. They needed something. And it wasn't uh, a good or wise decision. It was a decision of need and urgency. And um, some of them, it didn't turn out so well. And it just, it just troubles me. So get your support group. See a good surgeon with experience. It's my two cents, even if it's travel. Even if you need to do a teleconsult, which, by the way, Dr. Jenkins does, um, this is a disease we don't mess around with, my advice. Um, at this point, I'm going to open up to some questions. Um, so, Herb, if you want to shoot us some questions, 
there's a theoretical question at the bottom here. I don't know if this one has been asked by a particular person, but I'll, I'll address this. Uh, diagnostic imaging, athletic trainers, sports med, acupuncture, massage. Okay. Um, I know a guy who knows a guy who knows a guy who does diagnostic imaging. Uh, I'm a big fan of it. And I'll just go through it very quickly. This disease is caused by a bunch of different underlying things. Uh, not only does a good clinical doc have to face the fact that the ruse tests, the AdSense tests, all of these clinical tests are 50% or so. So you want to confirm the diagnosis with imaging like we do in every other disease. But the other thing is there are many different causes underneath here. And you want to know what those causes are because it could change the type of surgery or treatment you get if it's non-surgical. So diagnostic imaging is big. MR by far is the best for that with an experienced person. CT is usable. Ultrasound has some advantages, but not great. And x-rays are just, there's no need for them really. Um, athletic trainers, um, I'm going to pass over that for a second. Uh, let me go to the end. Acupuncture and massage, I've seen work in some patients. And I think these uh, additional conservative care approaches combined with the rest of the team can have good value. Again, it will depend on the patient. Certainly, we know that muscle imbalance, if that can be treated with acupuncture or massage or selective injections, it, it can make an improvement. Um, art comments on athletic trainers or sports med. Um, I, I'll just say this. We have seen some Major League Baseball pitchers, athletic trainers, deal with very high pressure situations and, you know, critical investments in elite athletes. And so they have to know a lot. Um, I haven't had enough interaction myself, I've had a little bit of interaction. They seem the ones I've worked with are very knowledgeable, very dedicated, but I don't know how much they know about TOS or I don't know if I you think, can. I think that's really the, the bottom line is they, they, they will hopefully be able to make a diagnosis, but may not have much specific treatment. Um, but if, you know, if there is somebody out there who's got a great management strategy, I want to know about them. Let me know. If you're out there and you've got, you think you've got the, the solution to TOS um, and you're a, a, an athletic trainer or a sports medicine or even an acupuncturist who manages TOS, let my office know. Reach out to me and say, hey, I can help your patients and we'll start a conversation about seeing how, if, if that's something that, that's useful. Um, you know, one of the most important things that I have found is that listening is, I mean, here I've been talking with doing a lot of talking here today, but I find listening is the best way for me to learn. Um, you know, there's an old saying is you learn nothing when your mouth is engaged. So I'm happy to listen to anybody who has and, and I've had conversations with one person or another, and some have I've learned things from, and others, you know, I'm not sure that we've seen eye to eye on on the way things work, and so it's it may not be um, a productive talk, but I, it doesn't mean I'm not willing to entertain it and and mm -hmm. and make a few new friends in the process. Um, but ultimately, you know, everybody knows one person who's been helped by a particular something. The real question is is when can you have a particular specialty or treatment strategy that has repeated and reproducible benefit mm -hmm. for any of the subsets of TOS that we have. And, and I'm much more impressed by somebody's treatment strategy than when they can tell me that they do one thing for one problem and a different, slightly different thing for a different presentation. And, and then that shows me that they understand the difference between the two because the mechanics, the biology, and the physics of, of what's going on are different. We, I'm still hoping to get a conversation in the future with maybe a few high-level athletic trainers. I think that there is um, a human component on top of that. When a Major League Baseball pitcher gets diagnosed with TOS, they tend to go to a very few providers in the country. And um, I've tried. When I read uh, on ESPN's website that a, a guy was diagnosed with TOS, I've tried to reach out to the team, the doctors, the agent, and there's like a stone wall in most cases, which is unfortunate because, like you say, Art, suppose I discussed it with them, they listened to me, and then they said, no, thanks, but no. 
well, at least they listened and then they made a better decision because they heard something. Um, so I believe I can add to the care for these people, but uh, so far I've had intermittent chances and hopefully that'll change. Um, I think athletic trainers, again, I'll emphasize this, they're under a lot of pressure. They're working with, you know, the Hope Diamond when they get a major league pitcher or a third baseman who's got TOS. These are very valuable people. And so the teams really try to restrict access and, you know, narrow it down. But I'm hoping in the future. All right. Uh, a dietitian, a cardiologist, or questions. So dietitian, I um, personally, I know somebody nearby and I've considered calling her because she do does a lot of nutritional work. There's plenty of evidence in the literature that uh, the inflammatory state, potentially the, the microbiome in the body, these can affect, it can affect us. The literature is challenging right now, but there is evidence of that. And I think if somebody wants to avail themselves of a good nutritionist, uh, I think in combination with the other things, even as we talked about acupuncture, massage therapy, those things may be valuable in particular people. And I'm not uh, closing my mind to it. Your thoughts? Um, I mean, I think certainly that a general inflammatory state something to be aware of and to try to manage. Um, I think that as far as just dealing with the TOS in particular, um, very often that doesn't just the inflammation doesn't cause TOS. Um, it can make existing TOS worse, um, but removing the inflammatory state rarely may, or reducing the inflammatory state rarely makes the TOS go away. Um, but, you know, certainly there are times that patients have more inflammation and reducing it is, can be part of a bigger treatment strategy. Nicely put. Herb, would you shoot us some questions from our viewers? Hi, Anna. Hi, Dr. Worden. I love your webinars. Thank you. Uh, I hope you love our guests because they really, as you can see, Dr. Jenkins and others contribute a lot of time and work to us, and I'm grateful for them. May I ask what MRI scanning equipment Nia Vista uses to produce such good quality imaging? Is it three Tesla? I live in Australia. Um, <laughs> thank you so much for viewing from Australia. That makes me feel very good and I appreciate it. So I'll say this, the machine is important. It's not too important. What Nia Vista is, is a technique that's intentionally designed to use standard MRI scanners. I'm not going around the country asking people to buy my new machine or a new coil that I used or to pay me for a special software because our plan here at Vanguard Specialty Imaging is we want to make this available in many places, hopefully even internationally. To do that, we need to use existing MRI machines and software and not charge to create a barrier to entry. So it's really the patents I have and the design we use is built around basic techniques that are available in just about any scanner at 1.5 Tesla or higher. And it requires training of the technologist, uh, injection of contrast at the right time, and then um, maneuvering the arms. And then it's a combination of different sequences, some of which show the lung and the fat and the muscle, some of which just show the arteries or the arteries and veins, some of which which just show the nerves. And combining those together with an experienced radiologist, and I've read thousands of these, along with my knowledge of working with people like Dr. Jenkins, Dr. Newkirk, Dr. Avery, pit, take your pick. Over time, I think that that's where we add the value. Um, so our patents matter. The technique matters more than the machine. If you're going to ask anything, what's the difference between a 1.5 Tesla and a 3 Tesla? The 3, three Tesla can be faster at the same resolution or it can be the same speed with a higher resolution. I don't think we need higher resolution than 1.5T to diagnose most people. Um, 3T magnet has some artifacts that 1.5T doesn't have, but we manage those. So we get good images from our imaging partners who use 1.5T and good images from our partners who do 3T. Most important part I would ask is that we have a good technologist I train the technologists and I feed back to them all the time after I look at their images. And a good radiologist like me, who's just unfortunately OCD about TOS, it's a lot of letters, isn't it? And, um, you know, I spend a lot of my life thinking about it and looking at this and, 
being a nerd, which helps patients hopefully. Okay, so I don't think it's a machine. I think it's our organization and how we really approach the disease in this community. And thank you, that's a really good question. And uh, another question from Anna. By the way, it's a very nice picture, your uh, icon. Uh, if an MRI shows hypertrophy in the scalenes, should physical therapy be trialed first or just have a scalenectomy, irrespective? Art, what do you think about going to a scalenectomy directly from a hypertrophied scalene on an MRI? I, I mean, first question is, is just because it looks hypertrophied on an MRI doesn't mean that's actually causing the symptoms. I mean, we've really got to connect the dots. Um, and then as there are a number of treatments that I would try prior to doing a scalenectomy. So um, scalenectomy, it, it's, it's, that, it's, it's basically like saying, you know, should you transplant the heart as soon as you think that there's a murmur there? No, I mean, let's, let's follow the standard treatment protocol and go from less invasive to more invasive and see at some point, do we get you off the train before you get to the, uh, the final station? Less invasive to more invasive. Very good. So we start out absolutely um, correlating the MRI findings with the clinical findings. That's the case for almost everything. If you get a patient art who comes in your office and they have two different levels of herniation in the lumbar spine, are you going to go in and operate on both? Uh, it depends on whether I've got open OR schedule tomorrow. No, of course not. <laughs> I mean, it's you do uh, you, you do what's right for the patient, and that's you. You know, by the same token, if somebody, even if I have a full OR schedule the next day, if somebody comes in with spinal cord compression, a massive disc herniation, mm -hmm. and they're falling all over the place, they don't leave my office. They go straight to the emergency right. room, and we take care of them whether they wanted to or not. Well, I mean, we don't drag people by their hair kicking and screaming, but you know, it doesn't take, if you come into my office falling in myelopathic spinal cord compression on a massive disc herniation, uh, there's gotta be something wrong with you for you not to go along with me saying, why don't you come to the nearest hospital and we'll fix this now. But let's say you um, start with a cervical spine MRI and there's a pretty bad disc bulge and the cord is compressed yeah, and no. they're not falling down. No, absolutely not. You treat right. you treat the patient, not the films, right. is the bottom line. And it's the same for our films. I think we add a tremendous value to the team, but I wouldn't start with the MRI and make a decision on surgery on that without an expert correlating. Okay. So hypertrophied scalenes could be due to a number of reasons and it can easily be reversible. I hope that answers your question, Anna. Tim Bits, while I think I received much improvement from my chiropractic team for my TOS, I want to explore using the talents of highly trained PTs, physical therapists, that have McKenzie Method Certification, MDT. Is this a good idea? So I'm not an expert and not very knowledgeable about McKenzie Method. Is this something, Art, that you've uh, had much experience with? No, I, I can't say that I'm uh, knowledgeable about it. I would defer to uh, one of my uh, physiatrists' uh, opinion as to the value of one uh, physical therapy. I, I would turn it around and say, you know, if you have a physical therapist or that has experience of using McKenzie on TOS, because McKenzie is not about TOS. McKenzie it's a system of, of looking at uh, musculoskeletal care. And so it's not it's not three exercises that are specific to TOS. So, um, you know, I, I, I believe me, there are a, a hundred different, I, I love it when I have somebody come into my office and they look at me like, well, I, I have followed the, the Barton Schmooten technique of physical therapy. I'm sure you're familiar with that. And I'll be like, nope, got nothing. Yep, there's a lot, of, a lot of good people out there doing things that we haven't discovered yet. So that's good. And if right. someone came but to me if, with this. If Dr. Barton Schmutten wants to come and tell me why they can treat TOS better than anybody, I'm listening. I'm listening. Right. Um, right. But by the same token, the way that, that I will listen probably the most readily is publish it. Put it out there. Put it in peer review. Let people look at your your data. Let let people and 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 prove it. Don't just say you do it. Prove you do it. That's what peer review is for. You get a bunch of people in the same area who are critical, 
and usually very critical. And if they pass it, that's good. Um, in terms of your question, there will be some answers coming up. We're going to be setting up a couple of these live streams with physical therapists of different disciplines. And I think that would be a great question to save for them. I apologize that I don't know anything about it now. I can read a bit about it, but it's out of my field. So I don't know what my opinion would be worth. Uh, if your physical therapist wants to talk to me, I, I'm, I'm all ears too. I'd love to hear about it. Or if you want to reach out with more specific questions through our website, uh, tosmri.com, and just fill out our contact form and be happy to talk to you about it. All right. Um, thank you, Drs. Warden and Jenkins, for your highly intelligent discussions. Thank you. Uh, concerning all these specialists, I'm always learning something new. That's very kind of you, and we really appreciate it. Again, I'm going to remind people like you, subscribe, hit the like button, spread the word on our social media. We want to help the next people down the road as well as you. Um, Anna asks, there we go. Anna has a lot of questions, so I'm glad she asks so politely. Which is a better diagnostic tool for neurogenic TOS? Scalene block and brachial plexus block together? I'm a bit confused what the difference is. Okay. Um, it's a good question that, um, you know, it's amazing art to me. Some of these patients ask these medical questions that uh, I don't see in other diseases. Um, so a scaling block has been done since the 1970s out on the West Coast in Los Angeles. They started doing it there. I think they used an electromyographic lead to make sure they were in the scaling, and then they injected roughly there. And they found if they injected uh, lidocaine that some patients would feel better. I've done some of these and patients do feel better. Um, the question is why? If you theoretically relax the muscle with an anesthetic, maybe that's what's happening. Or maybe there's pain arising from the muscle. It might be a pain generator. So you put an anesthetic in there and the pain generator slows down for a few minutes. Um, maybe when the muscle relaxes, some people have proposed that the first rib drops. I don't buy that for a second. There's been no proof of it, and it just doesn't make sense to me. I won't go into it. Uh, clearly, it has an effect, and we don't know why. But they, on the West Coast, uh, Dr. Julie Freischlag um, was one who was using this. She was active in the community at the time, um, along with Hugh Gellibert, her mock leader at UCLA, you know, good people. Um, what they, they did was they did a study where they took people with a positive response, meaning you did a scaling block. They reduced their symptoms. They took those people to surgery and said the people did well at surgery. So scaling block should be an indicator to go to surgery. This to me is a terrible study design for a few reasons. I'm not going to go into it in great detail, but I don't think a scaling block has been proven as an indication to surgery. A brachial plexus block would be different. You're not injecting directly into a muscle. You would be injecting around the nerves with any number of agents again. Um, theoretically to numb up the nerves or maybe do hydro dissection to loosen up the nerves so they can glide more easily. You might use a steroid or platelet-rich plasma or amniotic fluid or fat. Um, a number of ways to do it and without going into the boring details of it, there's not a lot of literature on hydro dissection. There is a lot of anesthesia literature on doing a block of the brachial plexus as regional anesthesia. So maybe they can have a procedure in their arm because you numbed up the brachial plexus. Uh, there's just a paper I pulled down today but haven't read yet about a certain type of block involving this for regional anesthesia. Um, it, it's a hard question to answer without knowing more specifics. Um, and it's also getting kind of technical. Art, do you want to um, throw in something on that? No, I mean, I, I echo what you're saying is that the details, I mean, the brachial plexus block you know, there are five major peripheral nerves that come out of the brachial plexus. There are cords, there are trunks, there are, um, you know, th this, this brachial plexus has about 15 different regions um, in th that you can inject into or and, and block part of. Um, and you also, when you do a block, you still run a small risk of injuring the nerve itself. Um, and so these are not... Um, the, right now, I wouldn't consider brachial plexus blocks of any kind to be an absolute diagnostic tool, um, and I rarely send patients for it, um, mainly also because there are major and minor blood vessels in the area that 
you could be injecting close to into as well. Um, it's just, uh, it's not something I do routinely as part of my diagnostic workup. Um, I prefer much more of the, the combination of clinical and radiologic imaging. And Scott, we've talked about that a lot. So, Thank you, Anna. Appreciate the question. Hi, Nick. This is Dr. Nick. Uh, he's a chiropractor. Um, what are the common injuries from crutches to the brachial plexus that do not resolve on their own? This is a good one. And um, I'm going to start, Art, with you. <laughs> well, I, I, I would say this is probably not a TOS discussion primarily. This, this is a separate, uh, you know, coming out from the bottom of the, of the plexus rather than from the thoracic outlet itself. Um, although if you fell while you were on crutches, that fall mm -hmm. forward might result in a TOS related injury. Um, and so, um, you know, I think it's, you know, we worry about radial nerve impingement, uh, long thoracic, I mean, it basically into the nerves that run in the area of the armpit, um, can be, can be impinged, uh, if you're using crutches, but as I said, it's a little bit of field of today's discussion. Um, but if, you know, if you want to have a, a, a more, uh, a lengthy discussion of these types of issues, uh, you know, that's something we could do offline. So it's a good thought because kind of where the thoracic outlet ends, in my opinion, is right at the coracoid process of the scapula, which is a hook that faces like this and the plexus goes underneath it. But it also is theoretically where a crutch could come in and press the plexus against bone. Um, I don't think crutch injuries are uncommon. Um, again, as Art said, if you fell on one or if you used it inappropriately, like, you know, a young person gets injured and uses crutches for the first time, they may just lean on it too much. And, you know, certainly pressure on nerves can occur. Or what is it, Saturday night palsy where, you know, Radio someone... Nerve palsy, yes. And there, there's a peroneal nerve around the top of the leg, uh, the, the mm. lower leg, right below the knee. There's a peripheral nerve, and people can fall asleep Saturday night palsy. Um, well, I think the yeah, Saturday night, the classic Saturday night palsy is you fell asleep with the arm on the chair, and you get a radial nerve palsy from okay. compression there. What's um, the one and, I'm thinking of where you fall asleep and you get the superficial peroneal nerve? I know there's some name, and I'm blanking. Well, it, there's the, the, the knee, there's like the knee tackled uh, injury that, uh, you know, football players get if they crack their fibular head. Um, right. and that's another one. Um, yeah, I, I always have to make sure that, it, you know, if somebody comes in with a, an acute foot drop that or, or a, uh, a sciatic nerve that they don't have a peripheral impingement. So, yeah, these right. are, right. it's always important to understand the, the role of one and what overlaps one area to another, just like, we said, you know, somebody has a, a C7, T1 uh, foraminal disc herniation that can cause C8 radiculopathy, which overlaps with ulnar neuropathy, which overlaps with ulnar entrapment at the cubital tunnel, which, you know, so these are all... Or TOS, yeah. With, well, that's my point. It's like the, TO, the classic TOS is that it involves a, the, the ulnar nerve uh, component of uh, the brachial plexus um, the, the, the ulnar contribution to in or contribution into the ulnar nerve. And so these are all things that, that, that play in the same sandbox and figuring out, you know, who, who done it, you know, requires, uh, the, the careful detective work and, and making sure that you review all of the evidence and, and, uh, including the exculpatory evidence. Right. So, so crutch injuries, like other types of injuries where you directly impact the nerve, they do occur. And it is something worth considering because, as Art described, with a complex network of the brachial plexus, you get different symptoms by pressing on it in different places. But there's enough overlap that oftentimes you can't guess which structure has been involved. So a compression and a neuropathy in the axilla can occur. It's a, a very good question. Hi, Angela. How much are televisits for you both? I have state insurance, so I'm assuming that doesn't help. Um, what, what I would suggest is um, reach out to me through my website, through our contact form. I'm glad to connect you with Dr. Jenkins' office to discuss insurance. My practice doesn't accept insurance because all it's done for us is slow patients down. But I'm, I'm glad to talk with you about our process and our policy. 
Uh, we've kept our price very low and into the first part of next year will be low, but it'll probably be going up in March. Um, but please contact me and let me help you uh, directly. Yeah, and certainly if you want to reach out to my office, we're happy to tell you what that looks like. I prefer not to put that on the web uh, for many reasons. Hi, Christoph. Uh, thank you for the talk. Thank you. Thank you for coming. How would a TOS experienced surgeon decide the surgical approach, transaxillary versus supraclavicular, or the structures addressed? Pec minor, scalenes, rib. So this is this is an easy one for you, Art. It just takes yeah. about three hours. Yeah no, yeah, no problem. It just takes a thorough history, physical, uh, radiologic workup. Um, and, uh, and then to, if necessary, some ancillary testing, depending upon what you found in all of those. Um, yeah, it really, it's, that's, you just ask what, what does a TOS consult consist of? Um, and then they decide what type of treatment that it would be the most appropriate. Sometimes a, a, a surgeon will choose the procedure that they are most comfortable with Absolutely. that they think, that they think will address the anatomy that you have in particular, the safest way. Um, you know, some people know all of the techniques. Um, to be fair, I don't do transaxillary approaches. Um, I my training in in, in uh, neurosurgery and peripheral nerve surgery um, didn't really get into transaxillary approaches. However, uh, from my I a I work with a number of vascular surgeons, all of whom are capable of doing that if they thought it were the right approach. Um, but actually the way I have developed uh, a number of my surgical approaches um, to this, it has the same or lower complication rates of some of these other approaches uh, and addresses the, the issues both more directly and more, um, more completely as in, at least in my humble opinion. Um, and so um, it, but if I thought I didn't have the, the, the skill set to do a particular, I have no problem saying, I'm going to get you so-and-so. Um, and, you know, even some of them have even asked me to scrub on or watch their cases and see what they do. Um, sometimes they even want to know if I have advice on things, techniques that I have in neurosurgery or in my personal practice that they can make their, their techniques better with. And, and so, um, how constructive yeah. is that? That's great. That's great. So, Christoph, that's just that's like a million dollar question. And um, in my experience and from the literature, just as Art said, there are surgeons who get very comfortable with one approach. And because this is tiger country, that's what Jim Avery always says. And there's a lot of red and blue things you want to be careful with, as Art said. Um, there is a lot of value in having one approach that you know really darned well and you've done thousands of them in your career. There's value to that. Now, but at the same time, one of the things I would really love to do in my short time here on earth um, is to hopefully bring the imaging to the point that it can help people make decisions on these approaches because there are different underlying causes and I would believe there should be different surgical approaches for some of them that will evolve over time as we work with other good people. So um, as Art already said, combining the clinical assessment with imaging and sometimes consultation with other people who have different techniques will allow those decisions to be made. There is a, a paper, again, I pulled down today and haven't had time to read, compares robotic surgery with standard uh, supraclavicular approach. And the erotic surgery is showing a lot of promise with uh, good success rates and uh, lower complications, or at least equal complications, no worse. I uh, read a review paper recently that showed it was just as safe and, and better than a lot of standard approaches. Um, we will have to have a talk. I think this is a good idea. Uh, we'll have to have a roundtable with people like Dr. Jenkins and some other surgeons and discuss those different approaches. Um, but it's a very complex subject. And it's in flux. Hopefully it's changing as people like Art have his community where they discuss the different things and imaging shows where the pathology really exists. Um, I hope that helps. I know it's not a great definitive answer. Uh, Christoph has another one. What would you say are contraindications for surgery? For example, CRPS in the affected limb uh, or fibromyalgia. Uh, Art, this is a great one because I'm sure you deal with this sometimes. 
Yeah. No, absolutely. And so um, I think anytime you have a contraindication for surgery, it's um, there are going to be absolute contraindications. Oh, hell no. Don't do surgery. Um, and then there are also relative contraindications where you're looking at the risk benefit ratio of what the surgery has to offer. How much will it do for you? How much could it do to you? Um, and so it, it's, you know, there are some contraindications to surgery are, you know, heart is not healthy enough to have this surgery, you know, that, that there is, um, that there is no hope of re regaining the lost function because the damage is so severe that the nerves are mangled beyond recognition. Um, you know, that they're, they're so certainly having, uh, CRPS, uh, stands for C complex regional pain syndrome. Uh, it involves a, a, a pathological nerve state where nerves are so damaged that they are, um, that they are firing and misfiring in, in ways, um, that, so for example, if somebody has a concomitant neurologic problem, um, that doing TOS surgery won't fix that you have to have much more limited expectations of what that surgery can and can't do, or you have to do it in conjunction with a treatment of the primary problem or this, the additional ancillary problem. Um, and CRPS, we treat very differently than we treat um, TOS, um, even though they may actually have derived from the same original injury to begin with. Um, and, you know, it's like, you know, having both a stroke um, and a fractured spine, um, you know, treating the fractured spine won't make the stroke symptoms better. Um, and so it's, um, it's important to understand, you know, how bad is the CRPS? What are the expectations? Um, you know, are there medical contraindications? Um, and, you know, fibromyalgia is a very difficult entity to include in the discussion because, Unfortunately, for many doctors, fibromyalgia has different definitions. Um, you know, in some cases, fibromyalgia is overcalled, and in some cases, it's undercalled. Um, you know, for some people, fibromyalgia is a true diagnosis of exclusion after you've truly excluded everything else. Um, about 15 years ago, I saw a, a paper that showed that 10% of all patients who were diagnosed with fibromyalgia actually have a Chiari malformation. They have a treatable underlying neurologic condition that is completely not fibromyalgia, um, but they, it has some overlap with the symptoms of fibromyalgia. And so some patients are misdiagnosed. So it is, um, it's important to also understand, well, what to, what is the definition of fibromyalgia? How is it being treated? Um, and I've had a number of, of patients who have come to me with a diagnosis of fibromyalgia. And it turns out they didn't have fibromyalgia. They had X. And somebody just said, I'm going to call you fibromyalgia because you're more complicated than I feel like dealing with anymore. And I'm going to give you a drug that treats fibromyalgia. And I'm going to move you out of my practice because I've lost interest. Um, and I think that that is a disservice. Um, I think that, but there are some patients who truly the, 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 the thoughtful, uh, clinician has gone through the, the, the due diligence and the, and the due process. Um, and so for those patients, you know, if it's, if you have fibromyalgia and something else, that doesn't mean you can't have the something else treated. It just means that there are expectations about how much better you can do with the treatment because you have to di dive down deep into how much is coming from this and how much is coming from the fibromyalgia. This is one case that sounds like you really need a team and you, you really need somebody to quarterback the whole thing to put together all the different opinions from specialists. Um, have you heard from hydrodissection for treatment of TOS and any thoughts on it? So there's very little literature on hydrodissection of nerves. Um, some people are using hydrodissection for other things. I think there's potential for it from docs that I speak with who do some of this. Um, Dr. Ghosh has done some. Um, there's a guy, Rowan Paul in the city, San Francisco, that's done some. Um, I think the jury is out. 
I think theoretically there's potential value to it because we have evidence that the nerves suffer fibrosis or scarring. Um, I was reading something about venous congestion, meaning the veins not draining easily, causing fibrin deposition within the nerves. It's part of the blood clotting group. And so scar can form within nerves and around them, which theoretically could tie them down or tether them to the adjacent tissues. And the nerves need to glide when you move, especially as much as we move our shoulders, arms, and neck. So the jury is out. There is potential to it. And if a doc does it correctly, I think it's relatively low risk. There is some risk. Art had mentioned before that by doing a brachial plexus block, you could theoretically damage the nerves. And hydrodissection has to get very close to the nerve itself um, with a needle tip. So there's potential for injury, but not a great risk, I don't think. So um, unless, Art, you you know more about uh, hydrodissection than my little pitiful explanation, I, I just think there's not much data on it right now. No, I, I, I would throw it out as a challenge to those, if there are any pain docs out there who are watching and are interested. Um, study it. Don't just do it on a few patients and charge for it. Actually study it, you know, collaborate with other people who are doing it. Let's get some numbers together mm -hmm. because with large numbers of people doing the same thing, treating the condition with a particular way, we can actually change, um, you can change the way things are treated. Um, and, you know, it's, uh, you know, you need that data. on the other hand, some people are just more interested in doing a procedure that they can bill for and keeping the, the 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 information in their own silo because then it's their special sauce. So, um, I hope you're not saying it, that about me. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I'm just saying it's you know there's there there is um, you know you well I mean you 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 what you do is you you've got what ten nine ten centers uh, around the country that are doing this. This is not something you're keeping in a little silo here. No, that's true. And we spent a lot of time working, building connections with people like you and, you know, trying to figure out the key to this thing. Um, Angela has another question. How do we know if it's bilateral neurogenic TOS with pec minor syndrome or narrowing of the space of the discs of the cervical spine? Well, that's it. Angela, great question. Um, I'm going to start with this, but it's going to be, art will be more definitive. Um, uh, you can be confused between cervical spine disease and neurogenic TOS. Let's leave out pec minor syndrome for a second. Uh, clinically, docs might do a certain number of tests um, to check for whether it's spine disease, although they have somewhat limited accuracy. Um, they put their hands on your head and push down to see if they can cause narrowing of the neural foramina. A cervical spine MRI usually works great for that type of thing. And part of our test, even though we don't charge extra for it, is always the cervical spine to rule that out. And I would say since so many of our patients are younger, let's say 35 and under, um, it's rare to get cervical spine disease. You, you know, most people don't get herniations in their spine at young ages, there are exceptions. They almost never get degenerative joint disease where the side holes get narrowed to press on the nerves. So in the right patient population, clinically not usually a big concern because of the age range. Um, Art. Well, I, I would say I see a fair number of young people with disc herniations and disc, disc problems. Um, and sometimes the same injury that could lead to a TOS injury can also lead to a neck injury. Um, and so I, I, I certainly see a fair number of, uh, of, of you know, patients, young, even young patients with cervical disc pathology. Um, and especially some of the ones with congenital stenosis with um, one or the other, the more common uh, congenital anomalies. Um, it's, meaning, meaning that the spine starts out a little bit narrower than normal. Correct. Correct. So if you start with congenital stenosis, it doesn't take much for that to make it focally symptomatic because you have less room to accommodate because you just started out with a smaller apartment and somebody dropped a piano into your smaller apartment, it's going to be a lot harder to manage that apartment than if you had a huge apartment. Uh, so it, that's the metaphor that I use. Uh, so I, I would just say, um, if you want to figure out if it's bilateral NTOS with pec minor or if it's disc disease, see somebody who treats both and can tell you which or which 
symptoms are coming from which problem if you could be symptomatic from both. Is uh, if someone has central cord compression from a bulging disc, are the symptoms different than bilateral neurogenic TOS? Yeah, I, I would say it's important to differentiate betwixt or between or or is it the both together? Yeah, and, and Angela, people get cervical spine MRIs all the time. There's no radiation, and it's a quick way to certainly rule out that that's the source of pain. Um, Peck, um, just as a side note, Peck minor syndrome, I want to get into separately at a later point because um, you have another question here. How do we know what type of treatment is good for us with having multiple issues? So um, it's sort of a generic question, but, um, you know, it's a little hard for, I think, both of us to answer. You, you need to, I'll emphasize again, you need to have a quarterback if it's your primary care doc who assigns you to specialists to start finding one of those and eliminating that as a cause. Um, and Art's talked about this a lot, but yeah. Art, any yeah, no, I just, yeah, it's, you know, I, I wish we could, you know, this, this, obviously a webinar is really not the, the mechanism by which to, to, to take one patient and try to, to actually diagnose her. Uh, and, and I, you know, as I said, I think this is much more of an offline rather than an online. Um, as it is, I generally prefer to have much more specific conversations in the privacy because there's, there's no HIPAA uh, protection if you're sharing your medical information online for the whole world to see. Um, you know, it's it's generally speaking, I prefer to manage these things in a private HIPAA compliant environment rather than, you know, in front of everybody. But if you want to do it in front of everybody, maybe someday Scott will come up with a uh, an online webinar where we have a couple of volunteers who choose to go through the process of how a televisit would look like. That's not a bad idea at all. Uh, even if we have a patient who just tells a story without it being personal. Um, again, we, we're happy to have contacts with people like you, Angela, and to steer you to people like Dr. Jenkins and any others for specific things that you have. But it is better um, offline, private. Thank you. Um, Nick. Our chiropractor says, how helpful are muscle blocks to determine a diagnosis for TOS? Um, I've done them in the past. I haven't done them in a while because of COVID, and I have I don't have an office that's a physical place for patients. But from the literature and from my experience, um, muscle blocks have an effect, and I don't know why. And I've discussed this with people. I had a long discussion with Dean Donahue at MGH, the really sharp guy who does a lot of surgery and a lot of this type of... Uh, treatment, including muscle blocks. And uh, I don't think anybody has proven to me in the literature why they have the effect they do of reducing pain. Um, for that reason, and because we don't know the mechanism, I don't think it's an indication to go to surgery. Um, there are several possibilities. One is that the muscle is tight, and by relaxing it, you allow the, the neck and the collarbone and the shoulder blade to move to a new position. Another possibility is that the pain is arising from the anterior scaling and is referred to the upper extremity. And by using a, an anesthetic, you reduce that at least temporarily. Um, I, I just personally, if it were my brother, I wouldn't go to surgery based on a scaling block without the other things we've talked about. Bart, what's your experience been? Well, I, I think in many ways it's... Um... Blocks like this are what I would consider, you know, in, in a, using a legal metaphor, uh, circumstantial evidence. OK, and you can convict somebody of capital murder if all you have is circumstantial evidence, but you have a preponderance of the circumstantial evidence that there's really no reasonable person could disagree. And so what I do is I, I weigh the, the, the information I get from a muscle block in the setting of, in the context of what the other information is. And if I see somebody who's got maybe a narrowed, uh, you know, scaling triangle region uh, on the MRI and they've got reproducible pain primarily in the scaling triangle, um, you know, and, and it's when I compress in that area, they get their reproduction of their exact pain down the arm and that they, the block also elite, and that certainly gives me some confirmation. It gives me a little more confidence that targeting that one area 
Um, let's say they only get pain with reproduction and scaling triangle and they don't get costoclavicular work. That's somebody I might have either go for um, more of a, a, to consider having like a, a Botox to the, to the muscle for a little bit longer benefit um, and see if that also gives some relief um, or having a surgical treatment just to lice the, um, just to, to, to cut the scalene attachment and not necessarily do a first rib resection. Um, that would be more, more of either a super, super clavicular approach or even just a focal cut down on the scalene. Um, and so it's, um, these are the things that I take into my uh, context. Um, and so it, like Scott said, there's no one absolute that if you have this, then that. Um, but, you know, if, if you've looked at all the weighed all the evidence and you find that there is a reasonable degree of certainty and that reasonable degree of certainty warrants taking the surgical risks that go along with the treatment, then OK. And it, that's a decision that we make together as doc, as surgeon and patient, um, not, you know, I have booked you for surgery and you will show up. And if you do not. Two men in a white van will pick you up and take you there. He you sounds know, like Surgeon cool. Schultz from Hogan's Heroes. Uh, by the way, there there is also a possibility that when you get a scaling block, because you're injecting into a solid structure, that the lidocaine could just leak around the muscle and numb up the brachial plexus. There, you know. Anyway, I'm and just... That would, and that would confound the diagnosis because you'd get a, a much more heterogeneous... And, and there are also complications. Uh, you know, I had a patient who had a Botox to her, um, to her scaling muscle, and unfortunately, uh, she had swallowing problems for the next month. Hmm. Probably because it leaked out. Into right. the esophagus. Yeah. yeah. Uh, thanks for the question, Nick. Um, Anna says... Why do some people have recurring symptoms 18 months later huh? after having a rib resection, scalenectomy, neurolysis? All right. Um, the literature says, and I think this is pretty uniform over many years, that shortly after surgery, about 85% of people feel good to great. At two years, it's about 70% of people who feel good to great. And I've had people question how surgeons come to these outcomes. Is it you know, self-assessment, whatever. But the point is that clearly every study shows that over time there's a recurrence in a significant number of patients. Um, very little imaging has been done, but I can tell you I've done some imaging on post-op patients and almost all of the patients I've seen with recurrent or non-improved symptoms, they have thickening and inflammation of their brachial plexus. And this may be due to a number of things. Um, the plexus could have been manipulated during surgery. In most cases, I know because I ask, they've had neurolysis where this fibrous tissue we talked about before gets stripped off the outside of the, the brachial plexus components, and that may cause problems. I don't know that anybody's really studied that so well. Um, the um, I can tell you from Adson in the 1920s that he approached patients with cervical ribs, a little bit different patient group. But at the time, they had x-rays, so they would operate on patients with cervical ribs. They would Everybody was going after the cervical rib, but Adson, who's a very famous guy, now Art may have heard of him. Um, I, I guess he's the father of neurosurgery in this country, right? Uh, he said, well, why go after the cervical rib, which is in a complicated area? Why don't I just snip the insertion of the anterior scalene, called a scalenotomy, where you don't even remove the muscle? And several, many of his patients had recurrences, so he kind of dropped it. But they had great results in the beginning. And we don't have imaging at the time, so we don't know what the reason is. Maybe the muscles reattached to the rib, maybe scar tissue formed and trapped the brachial plexus. So right now I'd say there's a paucity of data, but certainly the data we do have says that, you know, a good amount of patients get recurrent uh, symptoms. Um, my educated guess is we shouldn't muck about too much in there. We shouldn't go in with a huge, broad procedure, but more of a focused procedure. I don't know if neurolysis is necessary. Um, most cases, the surgeons I've seen, or all cases, they have adequately decompressed the space between the rib and the collarbone. So I don't think there's persistent mechanical compression. Uh, I hope that's a partial answer. Now, her, uh, Art, I'll kick it to you. 
So I'd say, first of all, in many cases, while we may identify the byproduct of the true pathology, by the byproduct, um, I mean, you know, there may be the compression of the, the clavicle against the first rib, pinching the, the brachial plexus and the neurovascular bundle, um, or the neurovascular bundle being pinched. And but in many cases, it comes from another injury to one or more of the structures that support the scapula, which is what drives the clavicle, which is what caused the pinching. Um, and so if we don't treat the underlying pathology as well as the epiphenomena, the, the consequence, like we can treat the consequence and transiently make you feel better. But if the scapula is still unstable and the shoulder is still unstable and the arm, the brachial plexus is still being pulled on, mm -hmm. the likelihood is that it will, it'll find something else to get pinched against. Mm -hmm. um, in addition to that, one of my colleagues, uh, Dr. Ting, uh, he at Sinai, he's, he's great. He's, he's, uh, he's like a mad genius when it comes to vascular surgery. Um, he believes that uh, we get a significant um, vascular injury um, and that even uh, that some of these patients, they start getting, in addition to the injury, the, the scarring around the nerves, they can get scarring inside the blood vessels um, and that you can get recurrent clot formation or stenosis of the vessels that in, occurs internally without an external source that, and because as scar heals and matures, it shrinks, it shortens. So if you have a band crossing through a tube, it will start pulling the edges of the tube closer and closer together, essentially pinching it off from the inside without having any external co compression on it. And so, and, and he's done intraoperative ultrasounds of the blood, of blood vessels, you know, with an intravascular ultrasound, seeing these little um, septa that have developed and so th there are a lot of reasons why people can get recurrence of symptoms. Um, and, you know, it's one of the things I tell my patients is that this may come back. I'm going to, at this point, I'm going to ask for one more question if our moderator will tolerate us. And, and Art, thank you ahead of time for all your time and expertise. One more question. Samantha. Hi, Samantha. Uh, thank you both so much for taking the time to do these talks. What role do medications, specifically nerve medications, play in the role of treating and diagnosing TOS? Can these mask or impede treatment? So um, there are pain medications that people can use ranging from non-steroidals to opiates. There are nerve stabilizing agents that decrease the likelihood that a nerve will fire and give you pain signals just because it's pressed on. I've mentioned this before, there's really two types of nerve pain. There's the normal pain where you, you press on a thumbtack and the normal nerve says to your brain that hurts, but you could also be pressing on that nerve somewhere else, the same nerve that goes to your finger. And if you press on that nerve hard enough, it gives this abnormal uh, nerve signal to the brain, but your brain still feels like it's at the tip of your finger. Um, so nerve stabilizing agents can help reduce that like Lyrica but they have some side effects, significant side effects. Um, Art, do you want to take this? I don't know how much you use or see patients who are using uh, various medications. Absolutely. And, and I would say that, that none of these medications mask completely. You're not going to be taking a pill that's going to make a problem get worse and you won't notice it getting worse. What these do is they calm down a problem somewhat, but I, I, I've never seen anybody with TOS that we've put on neuropathic that has said, hey, I'm cured now. I'm good. No, no, I, I have no pain whatsoever. Yeah. They will always have some and there will be breakthrough. And it's, it is useful for some patients to give them these medications, but it's rarely a panacea that makes it go away or hides it completely that so you're you're unaware of progression of, you know, that my, you know, my hand's getting worse, but I have no pain anymore because I'm on the, 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 the gabapentin. Um, that's just not generally how it works. And so, um, you know, is it, so it doesn't necessarily impede treatment, um, but it can be useful to support it. 
Um, and in fact, many times we put patients on it postoperatively just to help calm mm -hmm. things down in the postoperative period. Good point. Uh, and see and see how that works. Or it can make it easier for a patient to go through physical therapy or other conservative approaches because they have less pain and guarding. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you, Samantha. So I'm going to remind everybody, first of all, to thank Art Jenkins, our guest, who contributes so much to our channel. Thanks, Art. Always a pleasure. Um, thank you, Angela. Um, guys, help us spread the word. Thank you all for viewing. You want to spread us to your favorite Facebook channel. You want to help connect patients. I want to get this channel to a 1,000 um, because we get some more freedom from Facebook, um, how to, how to, from YouTube, sorry, how to spread out. Uh, subscribe to us, hit the like button, um, come to our other social media outlets like Twitter, Facebook, et cetera, and, you know, help the next patient down the road. So again, thank you everybody for attending. I'm Dr. Scott Warden, the TOS guy. It's been a pleasure, Art, and uh, thank you all for the great questions, and we'll see you next time. Thanks again, Scott. Always a pleasure.